booktube it's Andrea here and I'm here today with one of my Marilyn Monroe book spotlights and this time we're going to be having a look at Blonde Heat the sizzling screen career of Marilyn Monroe by Richard Buskin now this came out originally and I should have looked this up first I told you that I don't plan these in 2001 so it's quite an old book but of course she's not making any more films anymore so it doesn't really matter now this is his second book on the films of Marilyn Monroe he did do a short one literally just called the films of Marilyn Monroe uh, a few years ago and I do have that one and that really was just not much different to the um, original films of Marilyn Monroe book that came out in the, I think it came out in 1964 by Michael Conway and Mark Ricci. So the difference when this book came out is obviously it's a great big coffee table book and it has in it lots of colour and black and white photographs and is about 256 pages long. So he takes her story from when she first started with her first film in uh, in Scudder Who's Scudder Hay where she was an uh, pretty much an extra and nothing more. You see the light's going to go every single time I uh, put the book up to show you some of the pictures. And goes right through to the end when she made Something's Got to Give in 1962 which was a film that was never released. Now unlike other books on films this book contains not only a synopsis of the plot and a list of the characters and actors cast and crew which it does um, it also contains I'm going on to my favorite film which is gentlemen for blondes as you can see we've got pictures of the lobby cards this scene was actually cut from the film. There's also, so they do the plot and the cast and crew, and there's a, a behind the scenes facts and opinions on the film in question, in this case, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. So it gives us some little facts, like at the start of 50, 1952, Carol Channing was briefly in the role. Um, after the 20th Century Fox had spent half a million dollars on securing the rights because Carol Channing had starred in the original Broadway version as Laura Liley. And then it was decided that Carol Channing didn't have enough box office appeal. So the part was scheduled to go to the reigning Fox Blonde, which was the time Betty Grable, who I also love. But Grable's star was sadly waning and she'd caused some trouble with uh, 20th Century Fox. So it went to rising star Marilyn Monroe. And just so that they could be guaranteed of box office gold, they brought in another well-known star, the famous Jane Russell, who they borrowed from uh, Howard Hughes. Now the plot is a little bit odd in this book because it was originally set in the 1920s, Jump for Blondes, and it, so it tells you how things aren't quite right. So for instance, it's 1952 in the film, costumes and everything are 52, so are the so it's a technology but the Olympic team are sailing to France for the Olympics not in 1952 so it gives you all of that and of course there's a few of what the critics said as well um, there are some lovely photographs throughout this book I will admit it, it is one of it is a lovely book um, if we go to the seven year itch you've got your famous skirt scene one and one of Marilyn and Tommy Yule and then there's a, another scene here that this was cut from the seven year itch where she played a kind of gangsters mole type character in a dream sequence I think it's very sad that these scenes were cut I'd love to see them and there's some offset candids so it goes through every single film she made critic views and the public reaction now he even includes things like how much the films cost which is information that 20th Century Fox generally hasn't released um, but where you can get that information he has so at the end we've got the unfinished project something's got to give and it does show you how her look and style changed over the years because it's in chronological order and that's what I like I do hate books where they don't have the books in chronological order See, I love this picture, I love this dress that sold a couple of years ago, or was it last year? Well, I know it sold. 
at auction. And I love, I love that dress. I think it's so stunning. She was wearing such simple styles in this film. Um, very classic look. And the costumes were by Jean-Louis, who also designed the Kennedy dress. And here's a nice rare one of her. You don't see very often. And the man in the picture there. Marilyn, there and behind her is her Marjorie Pleacher. But this guy is Whitey Snyder or Alan Whitey Snyder, and he is the makeup artist that did Marilyn's makeup from her first screen test to her final shots on Something's Got to Give. And they were very, very good friends. And there is a little chat, a little chapter at the end about. Um, the end of her life it doesn't go into the death which is great because I hate that um, a lot of detail with regards to the filming of something's got to give not as much as uh, where is it gone a book called The Last Take by Peter Brown and Patty Barr and that is really focuses on the last few years of her life it came out in the 90s as you can tell it's very discolored now but yeah so this is Blonde Heat, the sizzling screen career uh, of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it was published by Billboard Books, which is an imprint of Watson Guptill Publications. I think you can still get this. I've seen it on eBay. Fairly reasonably priced. This is my favourite book, which tells us about her films because it goes in into the plot, the cast and crew, behind the scenes facts, behind the scenes opinions, the critics view and the public's reaction. So we'll go to How to Marry a Millionaire because I've just opened the page on it and let's just see what we've got. Public reaction, How to Marry a Millionaire had its world premiere at LA's Fox Wiltshire Theatre on November the 4th, 1953, where Marilyn turned up on the arm of Nunley Johnson alongside Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart. Betty Grable did not attend. Produced for 1.87 million. How to Marry a Millionaire. Ugh. How to Marry a Millionaire made a whopping 7.3 million during its initial run, placing it second only to the rope on the list of Fox Top money earners up to that time, and the first among those that Marin would appear on throughout her career. So you've got little bits like that, and I think it's, it's well worth picking up a copy of this Marilyn book if you find it. I particularly love this one. I do pick this one up quite a lot, so wholly recommend this one. So that is my Marilyn book spotlight for this uh, this edition. If there are any Marilyn books that you want to see a spotlight on, there is a video, I will link it below, of a Marilyn bookshelf tour that I did a while back. It is a very long tour, it's about 39 minutes long, because I do have over 300 Marilyn books in my collection. But if you wanted to have a quick look through there and you wanted to, me to go and pull out one of the books to go through with you, tell you what I think of it, Please let me know in the comments below and I will happily do that. Uh, obviously, there are so many of them. I love my Marilyn book collection. I've been collecting them since 1990. And still they grow. And I'm stroking them now, that's really sad. Anyway, I, like I said, I hope you enjoyed this. Like I said, let me know in the comments below if there's a book you want me to tell you about. Uh, if you've read this one, did you like it? What did you think about it? Let me know. And also don't forget to share this with friends who might like it as well. And subscribe, of course, if you're not already a subscriber. And I will see you very soon. Bye now.